And that was another press briefing, this time around the Minister for Youth and Sports giving us uh, some information on the gradual step to ease restrictions in the sports industry. And later we'll have uh, the sports fraternity have a conversation with us on what they think about the steps also indicated by the minister as well. This is COVID-19 360. We're on till 11.30 a.m. And if you run a small micro or medium scale enterprise, then today's conversation is definitely for you. How can you apply for the loan from the corona alleviation fund and so we'll be talking about that with the executive director for the nbssi and so keep watching but before that let's take a look at our news updates for today welcome to news update and minister leah tadisi disclosed that the supplies are needed in healthcare facilities across the country. The country's industrial parks have hinted in the past that it was diversifying to the production of masks, wearing of masks is compulsory in the capital and other parts of the country. The deputy governor of Nigeria's northwestern state of Bauchi has tested positive for coronavirus. The state's media official said Baba Tila was in self-isolation and samples from all his contacts were taken for testing. The deputy governor is thought to have contracted the virus while working as the chairman for the tax force in charge of coronavirus response. According to a statement by the state government, he had shown symptoms before his samples were taken and tested. Bauchi governor Bala Mohammed has wished his deputy quick recovery and urged residents to keep following regulations to stop the spread of the virus. Cameroon has recorded a rise in new coronavirus cases after reopening schools on June 1. The country reported 254 new cases on Monday and 188 new cases on Tuesday. The government said it had put safety measures to protect learners that include cleaning of classrooms and distribution of sanitizers and face masks. Final year students and university students who resumed studies were sitting meters apart. Education officials have threatened teachers who failed to report back to school after some of them expressed concern about the rise in coronavirus cases, according to Journal du Cameroon News Update. A South African court has found some coronavirus lockdown regulations imposed on the government unconstitutional and invalid. The case was filed by a community group, Liberty Fighters Network, who challenged the government's response measures announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa. The High Court in the capital of Pretoria ruled on Tuesday that the regulations are not rationally connected to the objectives of slowing the rate of the infection or limiting the spread thereof. It, however, suspended the judgment for 14 days to give government time to overhaul the regulations. The cabinet has said it will review, amend and republish the regulations, but that the measures will remain in place for now, according to a statement. And that's all for news updates on COVID-19 360. Thank you so much, Della. It's still COVID-19 360. Now, before we start our conversation, let's quickly take a look at the case count so far. Now, by the 31st of May, we had recorded 8,070 cases with 36 deaths. Now, the number has increased uh, by two in terms of death. We have 38 deaths at the moment, with a total of 8,297 confirmed cases and 2,986 uh, recoveries. Now, when we look at the website, the Ghana Health Service website dedicated to COVID-19, you'd realize that they also have included a section to, um, you know, um, inform you of the active cases. So out of the over 8,000 cases that uh, have been confirmed in the country, we have 5,273 active cases. Now, let's take a look at the case count per region. And if you look on this side, it gives you an indication that Greater Accra region still is in the lead with the number number of uh, cases recorded. So we currently have 5,798 of the total cases recorded in the Greater Accra region with Ashanti region, uh, 1,263. The Western region, uh, which was announced to have become a hot spot as well, now has 436 cases with Central region following closely with 410. And so it gives you a clear indication of all the regions except a half a region, which is yet to record a case and again a closer look at the website gives you the hot spots uh, in terms of the various regions and you know the districts where you'd find most of the cases 
And then we also have a chart here that also indicates that the male population are still the most affected, representing 60% of the total cases, with females representing 40% of the total cases. So that's about it for Ghana's case count. Later, we'll give you updates on Africa and the globe as well. But let's talk about the coronavirus alleviation um you know soft loan scheme and this was launched by the president on the 19th of may where they are of course in collaboration with the national board for small scale industries um and some selected financial institutions will be providing so soft um you know loans for businesses including small micro and medium scale enterprises and this is supposed to mitigate the adverse effect of the pandemic on their businesses and so in the studios this morning we have mrs kosi yankee aye and she is the executive director for nbssi and she joins us good morning good morning i hope you're well thank you for coming thank you for having me all right so i remember during the press briefing um some time back i think it was on the 21st of may 2020 you mentioned that about five thousand or more people had registered um you know for the scheme but when you also look at the details, there's a four-step, um, you know, um, directive on how you can apply for it. And so you need to get a unique code as well so you can use that to register. First of all, I want to find out how many people have been able to get to the point of registering for the unique code. We have over 60,000 plus who have um, really come out to register for that unique code. Okay. And um, we've been working with them for some time now. So all these people who have the unique code, have they fully registered as well? Because you need that unique code to be able to register for the loan. Yes. So does that correspond with the total number of people who have been able to register for them? No, it doesn't correspond. I think that as you discussed, um, when the project was launched on the 19th of May, on the 20th of May, we opened the application process. Mm -hmm. And really, there are four stages, but there are two steps to it. Okay. The first step is for applicants to register. And through that registration, we do an analysis of um, what your turnover is, the number of employees that you say you have. And then also, it gives us a better view of who you are mm. and what you're requesting for. Okay. And after that stage of registration, we also verify your identity. Okay. And if, the identi if you're really um, who you say you are. Then from that stage, you go on to getting the unique reference code, mm -hmm. which will then allow you to go to the second stage of the application process, which is giving us a lot more information to then determine how to assess your business. Okay. So the first stage also gives us a better understanding of if you're a micro business, if you're a small or a medium business, and which application process you need to go through. Okay. Right. So in that case, um, have there been people who have qualified to actually get the loans? So the, it allows you to be eligible yeah. to go through the process. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's the process we are. So in. that means that the NBSSI, which is managing the fund, has not um, you know, come up with a list yet of some people who may have qualified for the loans. Have you started this burden? No, we haven't started sharing okay. that out yet. When does that happen? Do you need soon. to have? Okay. Very soon that would come out. And one of the things, as I mentioned, is that it's a rolling process. Mm -hmm. So it will come um, as and when. But the beauty of the system allows us to be able to see what is happening on the platform, how many people are registering, uh, what stages they are. And we've even instituted a system where if there are challenges for people, we can call them or they okay. can call us and then we can engage them in the process. What are usually the challenges that people face when they're trying to register for the loan? So I think that there are various factors that, you know, they have. And the beauty of what we're doing is also a learning process for the future and even to update what we have. So you realize that people have challenges with um, keeping, inputting their TIN numbers where it is needed, or people have challenges in verifying their identities because uh -huh. the IDs may be fake or they have questions. And the system has been set up where if you put in the, your ID number, it automatically pops out your name. Okay. So we're able to see if you own it or you don't own the, um, the details on that. Okay. So that also has come up as some of the challenges that we have faced. We also have seen challenges where people are registering with other people's um, ID numbers. They or, are? Or even people's Momo numbers or using one bank account for about 30 people. So we wow. see that in the system. And so those are some of the challenges that people are having. Because if you use a TIN number, to be able to stop fraud, 
we allowed it where you couldn't have two TIN numbers mm. as well. Okay. So maybe there could be some, so we work on all of that to ensure that we, we are supporting them. Are people using their personal TIN or business TIN? So, you know, in Ghana, you have two. There's the personal and the business. And yeah. for a lot of the micro-businesses, it's their personal tin. That's for sole true. proprietors, it is your personal tin. It's not okay. your business tin. And so for sole proprietorship, you use your personal tin. So it's, it's a combination of both. It's and it's fine? Yes. Okay. It, it, it is. Especially for the beginning, you know, in terms of putting your personal tin number. But the truth is, if you have a business tin, then you you most variably will have a personal tip. Definitely. Yes. I see. Okay. That's interesting. And by the way, for those of you who run, uh, you know, the small, micro, and medium-scale enterprises, if you have any questions um, for Madame Kosi Aye, please send them in at TV3 Ghana on social media and also on our WhatsApp pages as well. It's important that we hear from you. But uh, there's a clear indication that for a lot of these businesses, they probably run down because there was no demand for their goods and services. And as a result, some of them were not able to pay salaries mm -hmm. and all of that. So would it be a problem if most of these businesses are applying for the loans, not because they want to invest in the business necessarily, but to pay off you know, the debts that they may have accrued as a result of coronavirus? Would that be a problem? So if you remember on the 27th of March when the President, His Excellency Nanadu Dankwa, came out to talk about this and commit that government was going to bring 600 million Ghana cities to support it, mm. it was really to strengthen the micro, small and medium enterprises and really looking at a time like this where they were going through a lot of challenges. So for the funds that were committed, it was looking at at this point where there are challenges, where people are suffering, the businesses are suffering. How do we sustain them, mm -hmm. right? And during that period or during this period of the COVID, you'd realize that a lot of people stayed home. So people uh, spent their working capital. You also realize that people couldn't pay salaries. So they have arrears of salaries or even rent. Mm -hmm. And so this was supposed to come in and provide that kind of relief. Relief so that they'll be able to sustain and hold their businesses, mm -hmm. right? And then they would be able to, in the future, see how we can do a recovery or a growth phase of what we've been doing. And so for a lot of the work we're doing, it's really how do we provide you with support? If you have salary areas, you want to pay staff, if you want to support with rent, if you want to buy raw materials to continue with the growth, mm. you know, all of that is to make sure that we don't shut down businesses, but we sustain them at a period such as this. Okay. Now, still talking about these businesses, uh, I remember during the press briefing, you mentioned as well that the interest initially um, was around 5%, but after a stakeholder meeting, it was reduced to 3%. What are some of the reasons that led to the reduction um, of the interest rate? I think that the president, in his wisdom, along with what information he has, was able to realize that there was a challenge. I mean, over the past few months, if I may say, um, the, a lot of work and thought went into the development of this program. So it wasn't that one day the president announced it and we came out with it. Mm. But really, there was a lot of background work. There was a survey done of about 1,000 about businesses to understand their needs. Okay. As at when COVID hit mm. and what they were expecting would impact their businesses and what the needs that they had, what were the needs that they had. Then also in terms of seeing world practices, what was happening around the world and what were people really charging around the world. Mm. For a lot of countries, there were different um, amounts. And so for us to make an informed decision as to how best then do we also support Ghanaians. And he realized because of the lockdown, some people lost a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. And even those who were not within the lockdown communities also had a lot of impact. Where if they had products coming from Techiman, Kintampo, other countries, they couldn't really do as much as they had. So they had lost some form of income. Yeah. So it was best for us to provide some form of relief for them. And so all that thinking went into where we are now. I see. And now they also get to choose, for some of the businesses, they get to choose whether they go with a two to three year, um, or is it a one year moratorium? Um, businesses get to choose how long it will take them to pay? Yeah, so there's, um, in the, we've brought some flexibility, okay. right? As I mentioned, we looked at best practices and we realized that it's an emergency situation. People are looking for hope. Hence the product is called Enidaswo, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. Adom. Adom, yes. Yes, you know. <laughs> so you, you have a situation where people are looking for hope, there's Enidaswo. You're going through a challenge, you want to figure out how you're going to solve that challenge, and you're burdened. 
because especially for some exporters, they, they haven't exported in years. Mm -hmm. The world has changed. The way we do business has really changed. So the moratorium is up to one year. Yeah. And so even in the application process, you get the opportunity to choose if you want three to six months, you want nine months, you want 12 months. But it should not exceed the it one year. It should not exceed one year in payment. But how and do we ensure, do we have systems in place? And what about people who falter? What do we do? Yeah, so we've put in place various systems. One, it's important to note that we are not only providing financial support. Mm -hmm. So we are providing to a large extent some form of technical support. So we're providing technical support to some of the beneficiaries and especially those who we also see have potential for growth, mm -hmm. right? To be able to support them with the need to turn around their businesses and support them along that side. Okay. We're also providing them with a strong digitization support because we've realized that the world, as I mentioned, has changed. Very soon people, during this time, people were calling, people were going online and buying yeah. items. That could be a way of life in the near future and would have to live with that. Mm. Then also with regards to paying through the financial institutions. So NPSSI is not going to give out checks or hand out money to people. Mm. It's all going to go through participating financial institutions who would make disbursements and expect it to take back the funds from them. Okay. The other one is also looking at us from NBSSI. So even through the questions we ask what districts you are in, how mm -hmm. so that our Business advisory centers, which are 178 plus around the country, yeah. will go back to the field and check and see if your business exists, if the needs are, mm. provide mentoring, provide monitoring support, and as well as those who belong to associations, for the associations to be able to also provide some form of oversight. So for those who belong to associations, does it mean that you necessarily have to belong to an association? It doesn't necessarily mean you have to okay. belong to an association, but the associations are a form of a stopgap for us okay. to support us and assist us. And also, it's a better way to be able to see where are the businesses, because mm. there are various trade groups that have different mandates, right? There are different ones that um, focus on small-scale businesses, larger businesses, mm -hmm. growth businesses, electronic sector, swami sector, you know, all sorts of different ones. I see. So you need to, they have a better view of where the numbers are and where the people are. Okay. Well, we've already received a number of messages. Sure. And just because we have to buy time, I'll go over to the screen. And these are messages from our viewers. So I'll ask them so you can respond. Um, to them. Okay. So good morning, TV3. Thank you for the good work done. Please ask the NBSSI director that what's the highest amount to apply for and how long will it take for disbursement? That's Dogbe Dixon from Konongo. So um, thank you, Dogbe. I think that one of the things we always say is that you need to see and understand your business. And mm -hmm. once you understand your business, you know the limit to put in. Yeah. You know, and I think it's a better way than for me to limit people with the numbers that we give. So we advise that as much as possible, you input in what your needs are. So if we can get a better understanding of our business, what the needs are, are we mm. paying for rent or salary, and how much does that really cost? Okay. And then we can put that in. So no matter how high my amount is, I should just input that? You should input what your needs are. Okay. All right. Good morning, Bella. I'd like to know if small businesses with no employees, but just the owner, are qualified for the loan. Yes, they are. I think it's also quite important to note that we gave a definition for what a micro, small, and medium enterprise is. Yeah. So a micro business is a business with employees within the range of one to five. That means that one, you yourself, yourself, you're mm -hmm. self-employed. It's a sole proprietorship. So yeah. you are entitled to apply. Absolutely. And the, um, the limit is 99 employees, not more than 99 employees yes. in the medium scale. Yeah. Okay. Please, I registered and received a text message that I have duly registered. Do I still have anything to do to be eligible? So if they have gone through the first step of the registration and they take their unique code, they used to need, they need that unique code to go through the second step, which is to do the application to give us more information of their needs and what exactly they will use their funds for. So would advise that they go on to that level and then work. All right. Maybe they've been there. And so if they have, would actually respond and give them information when the time is Okay. Due. You're doing a good job. After accessing my, uh, after assessing my unique code, Okay, it's difficult to register or apply for the cap. If she can elaborate on that a little more, this is Impact Shoes GH. I'm not sure what the current challenge is with mm. regards to your ability to assess it, but if you can go back to the second step in terms of the application to give us more information, that would be great. 
But if he's having challenges, I advise that he calls the call center, okay. which is 0302-747777. Okay. All right. I registered for the CAP and was given a code. Do I have to do any further registration with a code again? Or once I'm given a code, that's it? Okay. So thank you. As we mentioned, it's a two-step approach. So the first step was when you give us information for us to assess which of the buckets you fall in, if you're a micro, medium, small, or a large business. So with that information, we'll email you the text message that gave you that unique reference code. Also has a URL on it. So mm. you go back on that URL and complete the application process. All right. This one says, I made a mistake with my contact number when registering, so I couldn't get the unique code. How do I change the number and get my unique code? So that's a, a, a very good one. So to go back and get your unique code, you need to do star 718 star 555 hash. And you go through the process, go to the second option and put in your TIN number and automatically it will give you back your unique reference code so you can go on and apply. For Could it. you just give us the code again? Star, star 718 star 555 hash. Okay. All right. And this is for any mistake at all, not necessarily just your... Yeah, so if you can't find your unique reference code and you put that in, it would give you your unique reference. Or if you mm. lose, then if you keep it somewhere and you can't find it, you can always go back. Mm. The other thing is if you also want to figure out the status of your application, you can go You on. can do that. Okay. Hi, my name is Kayanti Joseph, a student nurse at the whole nursing school. I tried my way through the process and my problem is the portion for business registration number. When an earlier portion requests for registration type, I chose not formally registered, but still saw a portion for registration number. Do I stand a chance um, for typing none, nothing at the registration number field? I think that for those, it depends on the amount he applied for. Because if he applied for a, a number, or if he falls within the category of a small and a medium, it will ask for a business registration. Because we mm. believe that at that point, you should have been able to formalize. All right. Hi, Bella. I want to know if market women can apply for the package. And what are the processes? A market woman can apply. Mm. You know, that is a business. You are informally set up in the same process, right? Or you can visit any of our district offices or call the numbers that I gave, and then you would have access to the application form to be able to apply for this. Mm. Okay. Uh, time is running. I know you have to be somewhere, but we'll just take a few more That's and then fine. we can wrap up. Good morning, Bella. Uh, please, can you ask Madame Kosi how one can register online if there's a website for that I'd be happy um, if she could mention it. George from Cape Coast. Yeah. So, George, our website is www.nbssi.gov.gh slash cap support. And there you can go to start the application process. Mm. Good morning, Bella. Please, I want to know if someone has not uh, registered his or her company but has a TIN number since 2018 can apply for the government fund. I'm a caterer and I'm working from home with four workers. Thank you. Yes, you have the opportunity to apply. You can go ahead and apply, but then it would classify you under the micro. Okay, so final three questions. Good morning, Bella. Please ask uh, the lady. She's executive director for NBSSI. Uh, I made a mistake with my loan amount and annual turnover, and I want to make changes, but the system does not allow that. How can they help me? This is Jane from Bogatanga. Is it the same with, um, you know, the code you gave for if you want to change? Okay. So, you know, we realize that a lot of people are rushing through the system. Mm -hmm. So they're giving a lot of their wrong phone numbers or giving someone. It's important that we pay attention mm -hmm. to the numbers we are putting in and also putting in the turnover. We also have situations where people put in their tin or they put in the turnover. They speak to someone and say, oh. You applied for more. I'm going to come back and apply for more. Yeah. And you've already applied and the system has gone through. But you can email us. And once you email us, or you can call the call center and they note it. And you have to make a case because I can't go into the system and allow you. Otherwise, I open a can of worms for the whole world to come and say, I've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. So after you've made a petition, we can then go and see how we address that petition. Okay. Uh, I'm at the application stage. I believe that's also from Jane. And so final one. Good morning, TV3. Please, what information is needed for the application? My dad has a fitting shop with about five workers where he does brick lining. Can he also apply? Of course. He can apply. Okay. It's an enterprise. It's a business. That's the informal and formal sector. 
This is 70 to 80 percent of um, the Ghanaian economy. Okay. And I think that it's our goal to make sure that they, they are supported. All right. So there was also an indication that the soft scheme loan was going to be made available to about 180,000 mm -hmm. businesses. Now, later, we also got an indication that it was going to be scaled down to about 10% of that, um, that, that figure. Is that true? I don't know who gave you that number, Okay. Uh, the, the scale down. But is that true? I, I have never said that. Did it come from me? No, it didn't come from so, you. Yes. So that's why I'm asking you, since you are the, the boss behind this, we want to find out if it's true. Because some businesses are saying that as a result, they are not sure if they can apply because what's the point? I if think that's one of the challenges I have with people going through this process mm. is that it didn't come from me. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of conversation outside. Yeah. And that's what happens within this section. So people always miss out. I think it's important to know that one, apply. The system hasn't closed. So apply for it and then tell us what your real needs are. I don't think I have come out to say 10% less of anything. Okay. And, you know, it's not everybody who has applied who would get it. So maybe you could, will get it. You mm -hmm. know, so as much as possible, let's do what we have to do. Then we worry about everything else later. Okay. It's really, really important. The other thing that is going on is that there's a lot of frauds. There's also in certain markets saying that if you pay, NBSSI will give it to you. NBSSI will not give it to you if you pay somebody for mm -hmm. anything. It's a process. So if you go through the process and you meet the process eligibility, we we'll ensure that as much as possible, we provide you with the support that you need. Mm. Even our own registration fees, which we would have charged due to our work, we have waived it for the next two months to ensure that this process goes through. Because we are in the position to provide support to people, not to actually derail people's work and make them struggle in this process. I see. Okay. Well, I, I, I just wanted to quickly give us the USSD code again, because again, not everybody can log on to the website. Yes. And so for people who don't have those smartphones or access to the website, they can use the USSD code. They can. Right? And okay. they can also reach out to us, as I mentioned on the phone numbers. They can be directed to our various offices. And the number is 0302 and they'll be directed. They, there's even paper application for those who cannot go online. Mm. So as much as possible, we've made this very accessible and we've made it really smooth sailing to help. If there are any challenges, they should also let us know. And as okay. much as possible, we'll work with them to resolve it. Okay. And quickly, um, someone also wants to know about the NBSSI MasterCard Foundation program and how different this is. First of all, is it similar to what's happening now? And if not, how different is this? So the MasterCard, NBSSI MasterCard program is also ongoing okay. and would also be started um, very soon. It's complementary to what government has done. I and see. I think it's important to know that when government came up and realized that we had a challenge and we're providing support, we had a lot of support from other people. Mm. And all of that will come together eventually to provide support to Ghanaians. We haven't even factored that into the numbers no? and even into this fund. Okay. Right? So the opportunity through the National Board for Small Scale Industries and under the leadership of the president is to ensure that as much as possible, we provide the right support and the needed support to Ghanaians. How much is involved in this MasterCard uh, NBSSI Foundation? It's currently upwards of 90 million. 90 million. Yes. Okay. Okay. And the Corona Alleviation Fund soft loan scheme, scheme is it 600 million Ghana cities or is it 1 billion? So it's 600 million from government of Ghana, 400 million from participating financial institution, which equates it to 1 billion cities. I see. And we're working okay. hard to ensure that Ghanaians will, mm. will, will, will support them to the mm. best of our ability. My producer is very happy because he says plus the 90 million MasterCard and BSSI, there's money, so he will apply. And so <laughs> if he has a need and has an enterprise, then he the can. Are entitled to. Okay, All well, right. so we hope that we've been able to provide some help, especially to the micro, small, and medium scale enterprises. And I've been speaking to Mrs. Kosi Yankee Aye, and she's the executive director for the National Board for Small Scale Industries. And they are managing the Corona Alleviation Fund soft um, skill, soft loan scheme. I always get this uh, confusing. It is, it is. But thank you so much for speaking thank to us. Thank you very much. And we wish you the very us. best. Thank All right. you. COVID 19 360 continues. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19, 360. And unfortunately, Anita is still under the weather. So please say a prayer for her. It's important. But let's cross over to our doctors now. Dr. Bertha Sewa Ai and Dr. Newman Arthur. Good morning and welcome. We missed you yesterday. <laughs> All right. I've, I've been looking forward to having a conversation with you about the easing of restrictions, um, you know, announced by the president. 
on Sunday. Now, basically, it's uh, about the final year students going back to school at the various levels, so JHS, SHS, and the tertiary level as well. Even though there are still some protocols to be observed, there's still a cause for worry because we do understand that in some other countries, even when they opened up the schools to some extent, they had to recall. Now, these students are also saying that they are a bit concerned about their health, about the possible spread of the virus, if they should all go back to school. Dr. Betha, what are your thoughts on the president's remarks? Well, I mean, I think that... Dr. Newman, can you please silence your... Yes, thank you very That's much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Very good, thank you. So I think the president was very cautious in ensuring that only the final year students were returning to school. And then he also made it clear that there should be a limit to the class sizes. Yes. Um, there weren't going to be more than 30, I believe, in a class. Mm -hmm. And so there are limitations and they need to be seated at least three feet apart. Um, these are all precautions. And what I'd like to add is that um, Ghana is not the only one who is going through this route. Yeah. I believe that they are watching what other countries are doing. Um, UK has asked its students to go back to school. Um, several countries are doing the same thing. And I think part of it may have come from the top echelons who said, you know what, let's learn to live with the virus. But I mean, to be very, very objective, it's good to have these guidelines. But I think the whole world is making a mistake. I mean, I just have to, I'm known for shooting from the hip and saying it as it is. Mm. And the reason is that, Bella, this is not the first time that the world has had pandemics. You know, in the 1300s, there was something called the bubonic plague. Mm -hmm. um, it killed 200 million people. It took away one third of Europe's um, population. Mm. And the only way they were able to get rid of it was quarantine and people just slowing everything down. Because it lasted for about, you know, from, I believe, 1346 to 1353 or so. Hmm. About seven years, people were just dying. I mean, 200 million people is a large number for something that happened 700 years ago. So it, it took quarantine, but it looks like our modern day everybody from top, top, top global leaders to... Because our national leaders will follow what the rest of the world is doing. Yeah. We're, we're in a hurry to get back to life at the risk of, you know, human life. So I think the students' concerns are very legitimate. I think the whole world is making a mistake. However, the president is using the best judgment mm -hmm. to give the best guidance, given what everybody else is doing. So I don't want to single Ghana out and say, hey, the whole world is not doing something, and we yeah. are asking our students to get back to school and it goes back to the global thing i was talking about if all the rich countries will come together and say look let's share our money let's all sit at home this is what we need this pandemic will end but then the economy is also facing a downturn so as much as you're saying that you know it looks like we're making a mistake won't we be dealing with even more serious challenges maybe years down the line if we decide that instead of getting people out there to work and to grow the economy further would rather, you know, have people in self-quarantine and all of that? But Bella, let me use the word of scripture. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man mm. if he the whole world and loses his soul? Um, that scripture was actually talking about the soul of a human being, not even your body. But yeah. what is the economy? I've done some business. What is money? Money is a means of exchanging goods and services. Money is not even real. We have created the value, meaning as a physician, if you come and see me, I decide that maybe the cost of you seeing me is $50. So we've quantified it. We started off with the barter system. I buy two fish from you. You take so much from me. And then finally, we decided to print money. It's just, it, it does, it's not even real. We've come up with something that allows us to exchange our services. So when we say the economy is going down, it just means that the value for some people's services is going down. It's not mm. as though um, God gave us one million and because we've done something, the money that God has given to the whole world is diminishing Yeah. because the earth's value has not changed. The amount of gold stock that is in the ground in Ghana hasn't changed. The, the value of our human capital has not changed. Nothing has changed. 
Mm. It's just the exchanging of this artificial thing we call money that has changed. I'm just looking at it realistically and broadly. So yes, and, and when we say the economy, really we're even start talking about the huge, huge companies, those who make billions of dollars a year. When their money is going down, we say the economy is changing. But if you look at it, our lives really haven't changed. You know mm. what I mean? Okay. So I, mean, I like to look at it broadly and really ask the tough questions. And I know this is all these um, propositions are a little bit from science, from physicians. But if you look at it and really sit back, and you want to be objective and not what Ashanti Four would say in Shishenimu, like you want to please people. Yeah. If you don't want to be a man pleaser and you want to be truly objective, you call it others as it is. Every, the whole world, and it's not just Ghana. We're going back at a time. Look at what is happening in America. Mm -hmm. People are on the streets and rightly so protesting for something, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. Of a pandemic and I believe yes. in the last 24 hours alone, about 24,000 new cases of coronavirus were reported because why we've broken down all the social distancing guidelines. I mean, in London this weekend, people were partying like there was nothing going on, just coming together. So um, I, we just have to be careful and uh, tread cautiously. That's all I'll say. But the guidelines that the, the president has given in themselves, if we adhere to it, it will greatly benefit and reduce the rate of transmission. Okay, Dr. Newman, now the students were also complaining that, you know, especially for University of Ghana students, they said that there was a directive earlier that any student who was facing challenges with internet connectivity and could not submit uh, you know, their project work, could not also complete their syllabus, would be given some three weeks to come back to school and study. So this would be intensive, and then after that they can write the exams. Now the president says that all final year students have to go back to school, do a six weeks intensive course, uh, you know, to, uh, to finish the syllabus before they write an exam. And they are saying that they would have preferred if they were given uh, the option to choose. Because if I have completed the syllabus, I don't see why I should go back to school. Is this not going to cause more panic, confusion, especially amongst the students? We're concerned about them completing the course, but this time around it looks as if we're going to be dealing with more confusion than expected. And please, you, you muted your sound. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, it generally is going to have some, some psychological impact on them. They may be more anxious, even trying to reorganize their lives to go back to school, where to find money to even go to school yeah. and all that. All those are really for some stress and anxiety. But, but that is how life is, actually. Nothing is easy. Yeah. So, life is not simple. But people have the capacity to adjust. You know, that, that is what I want to... It is not an impossible thing. Mm -hmm. It is something that they can adjust to if they really want to. And it also depends on the individual. Some individuals are, are coping nicely with this environment in this season because of all their coping strategies. Others who may not. So those who are not really coping well at home, they may even struggle to cope while living in yeah. school. Right? So it's not an impossible thing. Just that it's going to have some, uh, some panic here and there, stresses here and there. But yeah. they, are, they are going to put it may affect performance actually in school. It may, you know, because to condition your mind that like you're going to be at home and suddenly you have to go back to school, all the reorganization around. Some parents may even have exhausted their, their finances actually in this season. So trying to find another money for them to go to school may mm -hmm. be difficult. It may be difficult for some people. You know, some people is just they may go and drop them, they have all kinds of things to, to use in school, they will be cool. But if someone is really struggling financially at home, everything is really bad at home. Because if you cannot find internet in your area and at home, it's likely that your financial situation may be, be uh, not be too good. Right? And so yeah. that is what it is. But it's it's affecting every everybody everywhere. And um, and again Yeah. But, Yes. Again, you talked yeah. about parents not probably finding money because they also mentioned that the time frame given is too short. Now, the, pres the, the minister yesterday mentioned that if schools have all the arrangements in place, then on the 15th of June, they can start opening up for students. And these students are saying that two weeks is not enough to prepare for school. If I have a parent who's lost his or her job, can't find money to get the things I need to go back to school, this is not going to affect just her just him, my dad, or whoever, but it will affect me as well. And how am I supposed to be able to write exams, come to school, you know, complete the syllabus when I'm facing these challenges at home? 
No, that, that is the that is the practical real is the real issues that I think that personally I feel that whatever decisions we are taking at this time, we should be able to measure not just the physical and economic impact, but the mental and the social impact of whatever decisions we take. Because if we are thinking about the fact that the, the impact of the virus is is not significant in terms of all the death rates and all the percentages, what is the social and psychological impact on the individual? If we say it's go to school, what is the psychological and social impact? Can we quantify it and measure and say that two weeks is enough and we should give ourselves a month or two? You know, all those things we may have because it's really going to affect you. But my concern in this season is that whatever we are testing now, the anxiety, the stress, the impact, whatever it is, will be known in the, in the coming weeks. Mm. Because if people go to school and they start, we start reporting high numbers in school, then the panic is going to reach out. The mm. stresses is going to go Stigma. For example, there are a lot of churches who say they, they are not open. It's, it's okay, it's good. Is it? If they do, the church starts recording higher numbers. You are going to lose a lot of members. Okay. Right? Your church will be blocked by other people that you you decided to go ahead. So we are dealing with actual situations, right? Mm. And and the virus, well, there's some anxiety around it. There's some stress around it. There's stigma around it. Mm -hmm. So if you decide to take that, in the, in the next few weeks, we will know secondary schools. We will know in universities. We are going to find out from churches who are open, right, and see the impact of it. But if we are not able to manage this season well, <laughs> we are here to see. Okay, Dr. Bertha, <laughs> I mean, since you talked about churches, we might as well talk about them as well. Because now there's a limitation on the number of people you can have at a service. It has to be one hour with 25% of your church um, congregants or not more than 100 people in a room. They're saying you should air the room out and all of that, wear your nose mask. But is there still a possibility that we can transmit the virus? Uh, even if there are 100 people in the room, they are respecting the social distancing rules and all of that. Can there be a possibility of still transmitting this virus? And in that case, would the cap of 100 congregants at a time uh, prove futile? Yeah, I'm trying to find, I mean, I wonder if it should have been 100 or 25%, whichever one would create a space of um, at least three, I mean, three feet between people. Mm. Because if you take a couple like maybe Christ Temple, ICGC, if you have a hundred people in there, that's like a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Um, same maybe a church like Action Chapel. But, but if you take a small church, maybe somewhere in Kokumlemli, putting a hundred people in there is going to be quite a bit of overcrowding. So I wonder if we shouldn't have done maybe per square feet, maybe one person per square meter, mm. which would have been, uh, it would have placed a stronger um, guideline. Um, but I understand if some churches don't want to open at this time, um, because like I was telling you the other day, church transmission is live and active because the CDC has investigated more than two or three churches and they've closed after they've asked them, um, to open. So mm. even a lot of the pastors are in that high risk group where they are above 60. So they have to be thinking about their health as well. And I'm sure it is why a pastor like T.D. Jakes, who has one of the largest mega churches in America, yeah. he just did that even if the government has given guidelines or not, I'm not going to open my church. And if you look at our CDC guidelines here in the U.S., they said they are giving recommendations. And specifically, the wording says you can accept you can reject, mm -hmm. you can modify based on religious guidance. So the, that the president said June 7th is a, is a time for opening churches. It's not forcing every church to open on June 7th at all. Yeah. It is within the leader's decision, especially if you have your electronic worship and everything all set, because you know that by all, you are going to or two. Dr. Neiman, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Betha. Because we're dealing with a virus that can be transmitted when people don't have symptoms. So really, if we follow all the guidelines, which I noticed based on what the Minister for um, Chieftains here in Religious, religious Affairs, Affairs gave, that yes. it's actually 
an exact replica of the CDC guidelines, it goes through several things. These safety measures have to be in place. Make sure you've appointed somebody who a point person in the church has to be appointed for COVID-19. And everybody in the church needs to know who that person is. Um, you need to make sure you have all the hygienic things in place. Um, the, the, the hand sanitizers, soap, toilet facilities. You should have signs out there that people can clearly identify. Also, all your high-risk people with comorbidity should not be coming to church. Diabetes, mm -hmm. high blood pressure. Tell them not to come to church, whether they are church members or staff have a policy in place so that if staff members get sick, they will be paid while they are on sick leave. You have to ensure that there's a way of rapidly communicating with health authorities. If somebody reports sick at the church and they are exposed, you have to, there's going to be a lot of work. You have to find a way of informing health authorities. If somebody is sick at your church, you should have sort of like a sick bay or holding area at the church. If somebody yeah. comes with a fever, you can quickly isolate this person yeah um to be able to track everybody who comes to church and their contacts so that mm. when there's an out you can identify those who sat around this individual so the church is all, almost going to become like a small center for disease control people would have to be monitoring a lot um it would be it won't and then they said don't wave, wave your handkerchief yeah as much as possible so i mean every church leader is going to have to ask themselves am i willing to go and worship under these very very stringent um conditions, conditions yeah and, uh, what will be the repercussions if an outbreak occurs at my church and what is the, the the benefits versus the risk and remember that god said jesus himself said that there will come a time when people would worship me in, they will not come to this mountain you know Jesus was in a dialogue. He said they mm. will not come to this mountain, but people will worship God in spirit and in truth. So it is the heart of man. There are many, many Ghanaians who go to church, and yet they do all, all the things God says we shouldn't do. So it, it, it has to be a matter of searching deep within our hearts and learning to worship God from our hearts and not just in a building, you know. Mm. So it's going to be a quite a an interesting next few weeks as we see what happens in various churches. Absolutely. And, uh, well, le let's see how things go. But thank you so much to you both for speaking to us this morning. We're grateful. Yeah. And we'll see you on Friday because, unfortunately, tomorrow uh, we'll be having a forum at the same time. And so we'll not be able to yeah. transmit. Yes. All right. Dr. Neiman, yeah. thank you. You wanted to yeah. say something? My yeah. time is up. I have to go. I wanted to encourage uh, every pastor that they shouldn't be encouraged and see this season as a bad season because it is a season that God is preparing the church and other people for the next, the next, you know, the next thing that is going to happen to this world. So if any pastor is able to reach the, the, their generation, current, current people under these circumstances, all the systems they are building up now is going to be relevant very soon. Any mm. church that is not wise, not smart enough to know how to function and survive in this season, they will be relevant in, in the next in the next uh, few years because this is the new normal. Because mm. there are greater challenges coming up, there are yeah. more stuff coming up. So pastors should see this season as a preparatory season for them, right? Concerning what is going to happen to this world because there are bigger things coming. If you look all over the world, things are on the downward trend everywhere. Economy, politics, everything is on the downward trend. And there are serious major things that is going to come up in this world. So yeah. every pastor should see this as an opportunity to build themselves, build their systems, and build their members for bigger things that is yet to come. So okay. I want to encourage them. Definitely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Newman Arthur is a clinical psychologist, and Dr. Bertha Sewa Ayi is an infectious disease specialist. Now we're zooming into sports, and we'll be speaking to one of our sports journalists here along with the Ghana Football Association to find out what they make of the ministry's uh, directives given at the press briefing earlier. Keep watching, it's COVID-19 360. Alrighty, welcome back, it's COVID-19 360 and now we're focused on the sports industry. Now you do understand that even when the president uh, went ahead to ease partly restrictions, you know, it, you know, for social gatherings in other jurisdictions, sports, 
was still heavily restricted, even though he mentioned that there would be some avenue for non-contact sports to start, um, you know, again. And so today the Minister for Youth and Sport uh, came to the press briefing to expatiate on that and he gave details about the Youth Elite Package, which is an institution of a sports package for, um, you know, the Ghanaian sportsmen and women and, of course, facilities that have been greatly impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. And this is in collaboration with the YEA and the National Sports Authority and the Ghana Football Association. Now, he also touched on the non-contact sporting activities that can happen and gave details of that as well. So we'll be speaking um, to Yao Fosulabi, who is a sports journalist here at TV3. He joins us on the show. And also we have Prosper Ado, who is the general secretary for the Ghana Football Association. And Sadiq Adam is a sports journalist at ABM. And so gentlemen, you're all welcome. Thank you for joining me, by the way. Thank you. All right. Hey, I'll start you. off. OK. Prosper, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. I'll start off with you. And first of all, I just want you to give us uh, some more details on the youth elite package, um, you know, that the minister mentioned, because he said that it's being done in collaboration with the Ghana Football Association and the National Sports Authority and YEA. How much information do you have on that? And can you give us some more? Um, just to say that the um, Ghana Football Association has been engaging with our sector ministry, um, with the minister taking um, a really good lead on that in uh, getting us all together and getting us to be able to present proposals in order to then present uh, the ministry specific case to government. Mm. And so the engagement uh, started some time back. Um, we've been on it, um, uh, various meetings and then various engagements. And so we are at a point where the ministry um, has been crafting what would be a package for the sports sector. And okay. so that's where the Ghana Football Association falls under it. You would uh, notice that initially when the uh, stimulus package was announced for small scale industry, mm. um, a lot of the people thought football should be under it. But uh, our proposal is not under that uh, scheme. Our proposal oh, is through the ministry and it's under the ministry-specific uh, alleviation that is being worked out by the, by the ministry. All right. And, of course, this is supposed to come as support for the uh, sports industry as well. But then again, what I want to find out is that there are some doubts that the football clubs can also take, um, you know, take up the cost that comes with adhering to some of the social distancing directives that have been given. Because again, the minister mentioned that some non-contact um, you know, sports can start operating as well. And even if you can operate, you have to adhere to some of these um, you know, restrictions as well. Does it affect sports in any way? Uh, for the Ghana Football Association, um, our sport is a contact sport. Mm -hmm. um, what had happened um, was that, um, again, under the uh, COVID team of the government. We've had various engagements uh, once again. And so the government is, in terms of the alleviation and the relaxing of, of the of the uh, restrictions, yeah. there are various phases. So this is the first phase where non-contact sports have been, uh, uh, the restrictions have been relaxed for non-contact sports to start. So. Uh, we are working up to the next phase where we'll see more of the realization of the restrictions. Mm. And so along the line, I'm sure uh, football will take uh, its place. But for okay. now, uh, what has been announced by the first phase is non-contact sports. And I think the ministry has eloquently uh, dis uh, yeah. described what the non-contact sports are. Mm. Uh, these are sports where uh, the individuals playing will not have uh, personal contact so you uh, basically net to net and ball kind mm -hmm. of sports where like table tennis let me use table tennis for example okay you can play table tennis without coming into contact with the opponent mm -hmm. physically touching the opponent and so those ones if they observe all the protocols that the ministry and the sports authority will give then they, they will be able to start okay 
So they're, they're basically, all what we are doing into, is to ensure that uh, the sportsmen and women who partake in our sports are safe um, so that they, 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 then they can uh, produce for the sports and then the nation. All right. So it's all about safety okay. uh, first. As Before say, anything sports. else. Absolutely. Sadika, yeah. I'll come to you shortly, but let me ask Yao Fusulabi because you have been reporting on sports for many years. Yeah. Now, the onset of coronavirus slowed things down completely, yeah. but you were still able to generate, and not just you, but the sports uh, fraternity, you were able to still generate some stories. How easy or difficult was it? And looking at the directives by the ministry now, does it make things any easier for you? Well, I, I don't think it makes things easier. I just think um, it just um, lengthens this period when it, you know it's extremely difficult for us to get stories. I, mean, I feel like the whole COVID-19 situation has just given us, you know, a, a very huge headache. We've had to think more than we would usually have thought, you know, mm. for sports stories, just because there's, there's nothing really to look forward to. There's, there's no live games. There's, there's nothing to do. So you just need to, you know, go into you know, thinking some more just mm -hmm. to try to find out stories that you can do. And, and as you've mentioned, we've been able to uh, cover sports, you know, pretty well within these times. And that has just been really difficult because you have to... Um, go back to the archives, talk to old players, you know, sort of look at uh, certain players who have done great for, for, for Ghana and have not been recognized. We, we've been marking, you know, 10 years of this, 10 years of that, 15 years of this and that, you know, which has been, you know, extremely difficult. But I don't think that the ministry's directives changes anything. No? Uh, it, no, it doesn't. Just because, um, you know, football is the, is the major sport in Ghana. Yeah. Now, I mean, aside from football, you know, there's, there, there, are, there are so many boxing, other sports. There's which boxing, is also, which is also really good. Yeah. But the non-contact sports, like tennis, like, mm -hmm. like table tennis, like golf, mm -hmm. and other things, how many events or how many uh, meetups do they do in a year, mm -hmm. you know, for us to be able to cover, you know, for, 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 for our channels, just to, just to make things easier for us? So, I mean, it's still going to be quite difficult for us to get it. But, but I'm not... just indirectly a way to encourage these sports it's, whilst we wait for soccer extremely to extremely it's, it's a way to encourage it but do they have the money to be organizing things for us mm. to cover you know within this period now that football is, is, is over that's the question that we need to be asking mm. but later on today we are meeting with uh, the president of the ghana olympic committee to ask him questions on yeah on, on what he intends to do with this period when there's no football there's no boxing mm -hmm. and so his his uh, you know area of sports is where the focus will be now, and, and we'll see where we can go from there. And I mean, basically, some of the sports that he said are described as contact sports and still under restriction are arm wrestling, basketball, beach soccer, beach volley, boxing, fencing. What's fencing, though? <laughs> 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 fencing, is, fencing is basically, um, uh, you know, a, a sport where, you know, two, two guys use swords, but in, oh. in very protective clothing. And so I see. That's a, yeah. what they call fencing. That's what they call fencing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, football, kickboxing, rugby, taekwondo, um, the traditional wrestling, squash. These are some of the sports that are still under restriction. Sadiq, I'm bringing you in. Don't laugh at me when I ask what is fencing. Don't do that. <laughs> but anyway, what I want to find out is you also love your football. And I'm sure that there were some things you were looking out for as the... Uh, proceeded to ease the restrictions in some aspects. So what is it that you're disappointed about in terms of the press briefing today that you hope they should have touched on? Um, very well, thank you very much. I, I was very much disappointed in the fact that there was no clear-cut roadmap uh, towards the resumption of football. Uh, at this stage, uh, football has been I mean, on suspension for more than four months if I'm right, and uh, we, are, we are expected to have a very clear uh, roadmap uh, towards the resumption of football. If the ministry had been able to um, tell us the timelines, what they've done, some of the protocols they've put in place, the interactions they've had with clubs, some of the things that clubs are expected to do, or even the national teams, the under-17 team was in camp, before uh, the ban of football came I mean, into being. So I was expecting that the ministry would have been able to put in place, together with the Ghana Football Association, mm -hmm. uh, a, a roadmap that um, even after the lifting, uh, possibly lifting of the, I mean, restriction. Yeah. OK, well. Uh, we're having uh, a bit of a challenge with that. Okay. Return, uh, to... 
We're having a bit of a challenge with Sadiq Adam's um, <coughs> internet. But basically asking for a roadmap, which is was... It, is, it, is it clear now? Okay, it is clear. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so so I, I just wanted to see a roadmap uh, that would have been very, very clear to the football clubs and the national teams that uh, the restrictions will be lifted possibly by the next two months. And the following months, we'll be returning to training. We are we are going into pre-season for two weeks. Mm. Uh, the season will return in this. The, this are some of the stadia will be used. I didn't, I didn't hear anything uh, in, yeah. in that regard. It makes me uh, think that the Ministry and the Ghana Football Association really have not uh, been able to put uh, together a very clear roadmap. Even if the restrictions are lifted tomorrow, uh, mm. it will be very difficult to determine when football will receive. Prosper, what do you have to say about this, especially because looking at some countries, um, you know, th their football clubs are going ahead with the leagues and all of that, and so there were expectations that there would be a clear roadmap even for the local league as well. And that's we didn't get. And, you know, Sadiq is also saying that he was hoping for a clear cut plan. But that was obviously absent from the press briefing. What's your take? Okay. For, for football, we, uh, like I said, we've uh, engaged with the team. Uh, we've uh, sent a proposal. The proposal has a roadmap. But you see, you can't announce a roadmap. The roadmap starts from day one. So we know what we are doing day one, maybe day, day 14, uh, day 60, and things like that in the roadmap. If you don't know when you are starting day one, you can't announce it. So mm. like the minister said, this is the first phase of the restriction on sports. In the second phase or the third phase, wherever, um, whichever phase that football will be given a, re a realization of the restrictions, the roadmap would come with the with the announcement. But I mean, so I'm the, sure you have the plans for the faces already. Yes. So yes, that should a, also uh, determine uh, the roadmap. Once the restriction you know. is not lifted, you can't announce the roadmap because it's all dependent on when the restriction will be lifted. And but the shouldn't you give ample time? Because if you put out yeah, the roadmap, then everyone can also adequately prepare for whatever it yes. is that has been planned. But you need to you need to get the uh, restrictions lifted before you announce the roadmap. And so we would exercise restraint and then work with the ministry and the COVID team as we've been doing. And so we'll get to a point where uh, we all have the comfort to get the restriction relaxed. Then we can announce the roadmap to all our stakeholders. Because if today you go ahead and announce a roadmap that day one, individual uh, uh, footballers can start trading. Mm. or a, a group of four can start training. With that restriction, you are going ahead of yourself and then people would go and start training when the restriction has not been relaxed. And that's that's why the roadmap is, is being kept unannounced for the time being. Yeah, so and Sadiq, we'll, we'll... Is, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry to cut you, but is this a good enough explanation on why they couldn't put forward the roadmap? Sadiq, um, yeah. Uh, if, I, if, if I may come in, I think uh, uh, Prosper does not understand or doesn't get uh, maybe uh, the, the premise of uh, we asking for a roadmap. We've, we've seen from other countries, the plan is there. The restrictions are, we, we never know when these restrictions are going to be, I mean, removed. Yeah. So what happens is that the roadmap states clearly that if A happens, tomorrow B will happen. If B doesn't happen, we do A. That's what the roadmap will do. The football clubs are supposed to know whether the Ghana Football Association still wants to go ahead with the league, even if the restrictions travel for five months. That's a roadmap. Yeah. You, you are clear that the league will continue, even if the restrictions uh, I mean, uh, uh, go on for six, seven months. So we will restart in July, possibly. Uh, the restrictions will be up to the 31st of July. But after 31st of July, we will have one month, if the restrictions are lifted, as the president has said, we will have one clear month of preparation and registration before we move on. But if the restrictions are not lifted by the 31st of July, then we yeah. resume the league in September. So the clubs are clear that, okay, we can keep on hoping that we will go into preseason from the start of 31st July or uh, in August, from the first week of August, it's very likely that we will go into preseason. Mm -hmm. The players are home, the coaches are home. They need a, 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 some sort of document to be able to also plan. I'm not saying that they should roll out what they will do. 
But yeah. if A doesn't happen, B will happen, according to the association's plan uh, towards the easing of the restrictions. Yeah, if you had to give so, us a, so you know, an overview I, of to, how the... Okay, Prosper, you wanted to touch in... Okay. Yes, if I have to respond, we have that plan. So you have the plan. Yes, if restrictions are lifted today, we know the activities that will take place immediately, what will take place in a week's time, what will take place in two weeks' time, when the league will exactly. start. Exactly. Right. Okay. So we have that plan. But that I'm information is that only privy know... to you. What about the yes. sports journalists, the footballers, you know, the teams? Because they also need to prepare. Yes. The thing is that if you don't know the start date, you, you can give a tentative date. Uh, day one, this is what will happen. Day uh -huh. 60, the league will kick off. But we need to engage with the COVID team, the, the ministry, the sports authority, and get in line in terms of the roadmap. And everybody is assured that this is a workable roadmap. Then we can announce it. And that's why I'm saying that we need to exercise some restraint. We'll get to the point Obama wants us to get very okay. soon. All right, but yeah, if you could give us an overview of how we could return with the league, what would you say? Well, well I think that, I mean, what, what, what would happen, you know, is in Ghana, is, is something that is happening all over the world. I mean, there, there, are, there are so many things that we need to do. First, I mean, clubhouses need to be fumigated. The players mm -hmm. need to be tested regularly. And these are things that we need to do. And I think that's one of the major things that, that, that we are finding ourselves wanting at this point. Because if you are going to test every player in the Ghana Premier League and even the, in the Division One. How much money is that going to going to cost you know the, the stakeholders involved and stuff like that so yeah. these are all issues that you know we uh, need to be discussed and ironed out first and, and that's why I, I sort of agree with prosper in that sense just because you know in 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 rolling out a roadmap you, you need something that that would back you and say oh we need uh we, so and so players have been tested this and this is what we've done mm. before you know the roadmap is, is rolled out so i can understand him i can understand sadiq as well because i mean we personally spoke to uh, uh, one of the, the high-ranking members at Interallies, and mm -hmm. he's very, very distraught, saying that the GFA is not thinking about them because they feel like football can't go ahead behind closed doors, uh, uh, as it is happening around the world. And so if, you know, it, it's going to go on, what we need to do first is to test the players. Every mm -hmm. player needs to be tested. And the need, the, 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 there are so many things that need to go ahead, including, you know, how the players are going to train, how they are going to uh, keep themselves away from each other in that social distancing mood, how they are going to uh, 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 handle their kids, the, yeah. the ones that they wear, and, and everything. And it, it's, it's, it's all up to the clubs, it's up to the GFA, and up to the COVID uh, tax force as well to provide something that would help that the would clubs help. go ahead. Sadiq, you were shaking your head. I believe that was in disagreement with something <laughs> that one of them... I, 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 have a, I have a bit of disagreement when... Um, uh, they say we need to test the players and the coaches and all that. Can I know uh, it's happening in other countries. Uh, I know it's happening in other countries, okay. but we must as well domesticate some of these things. I'm not sure people are being tested for going to churches and the mosques. We are not testing people for going in, in the education. We are yeah. not testing the students. Understand? Well, it will well get to the point students have been asking that maybe that would be part of, you know, the measures being put in place, you know? What well, I understand Yao when he mentions that, but I do not believe that it should be mandatory or it's going to be mandatory that uh, uh, regardless of the time football returns or footballers want to go for, I mean, in group training, they are supposed to be tested before. I'm sure by July or by August, uh, people will feel free. If we are not testing members of the churches and mosques and, and students for returning to school and workers for going back to work, why do we feel that for football, everybody needs to be tested? I think we are placing so much of a load and some burden on, on football clubs unnecessarily because of the fact that in Europe, people are being tested. In Europe, we know how funds are being uh, donated or devoted to these football clubs, some from government, some from sponsors, some from even the health ministries. Mm. If we are not ready to do that, I don't think it's, it's going to be uh, compulsory that clubs need to be tested uh, all players need to be tested and team managers. If we are not testing people for entering the mocks and churches and schools, mm. why should it be compulsory for footballers to be tested before they go for, I mean, separate to individual trainings? Okay. All right. Well, I, I would have said yeah. that maybe football involves more contact than, um, you know, yeah, I, the I was going other... to, I was going yeah. to uh, just uh, add that 
You see, there are various scenarios. You have the extreme scenario where everybody or every participant in the game must be tested. Then we have a scenario where you, you um, um, group the participants into various sectors. So we have players who will come into contact. You have, um, uh, let's say, the ball boys, you have security, you have various participants in the game. Some do not come into contact with other people. They can work without coming into contact. So you can treat them differently if you are in terms of mm -hmm. the various scenarios. Okay. So scenarios, okay. one will be extreme. Extreme case scenario is what people have seen elsewhere where everybody in the game is tested. I see. Cars are fumigated, hotels are fumigated, the stadium itself have, uh, is fumigated, the football which is played is also fumigated. So that's one, that plan is there. And we've, we've studied, at the Ghana Football Association, we've studied what the Germans are doing, what the English are going to do, um, Czech Republic, various countries and what they, they've, been, they've, they've been, the plans they've put. And we've taken all this, we look at our, our, our situation and we've planned various scenarios. Mm. And so that's why I say we need some some patience and time to allow the stakeholders to, to tighten up all these loose and okay. check what is workable for Ghana. And then the, the ministry and the, the authorities can then can have the comfort to say that we are, we are uh, easing the, the restriction. And from that point, we can lay down the, plant, uh, the right. plans for our stakeholders, our players, and our, our clubs. So okay. all in okay. the works. All right. Thank you so much. Prosper Ado is the General Secretary for the Ghana Football Association. We've also been speaking to Sadiq Adam, who is a sports journalist at ABN, and Yao Fosu Labi is a sports journalist here at TV3. So gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, for you. joining us. And I know that the sports team will take the conversation further. And so to you watching as well, thank you for tuning in to COVID-19 